Welcome back to another one of our six questions podcasts here at Save Our States. Thank you so much for being a part of uh, what we're doing to protect and defend the Electoral College. I'm really excited to be here this morning with a uh, professor, a scholar, uh, someone with very, I think, deep knowledge and wisdom about what's going on in our country right now and uh, some of the, the ideas and, and uh, what's lurking behind the scenes. We're going to get into all of that today with Alan Mendenhall. He is the Associate Dean and the Grady Rosier Professor uh, in the Sorrell College of Business at Troy University. He's also a scholar with the Ludwig von Mises Institute, a policy advisor to the Heartland Institute, and the author of Shouting Softly, Lines on Law, Literature, and Culture. Uh, Alan, good morning. Good morning, Trent. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, really, really glad to uh, to talk with you here. And, and uh, let's just start with the book. Shouting Softly is a great title, but what what's that about? Well, it's actually a collection of different essays and reviews I had written. And when I submitted it to the publisher, St. Augustine's Press, the editor said, we like this, but your title, Collected Works of Alan Mendenhall, isn't going to work because you're not famous. And so you can't publish collected works. So what we'd like you to do is find a title and then synthesize all these pieces. And it seems as though you're writing on three topics, law, literature, and culture. So why don't you take all the essays and reviews about law, synthesize them into one piece and make them one section. Take all the essays about culture and do the same thing with culture and, and so on. And I followed the advice. It took me a lot longer to do that than I anticipated. And so the book came in a year late, but they still generously ran it. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's sort of a, a fun collection of uh, miscellany, we'll say. So my next, my next question, building off of that, you know, law and culture and literature and we're, you know, you're a student of, of uh, politics and public policy, obviously, and, and, and literature, which is a kind of art. What's the connection between those two things? Because I think, I think oftentimes people don't, don't believe that there is a connection. So, so make the argument. I mean, why, why does it make sense to be a scholar of both law and literature? Well, it doesn't always make sense, but there are connections insofar as both fields are very textual. I know that my literary theory courses as an undergraduate prepared me for the difficult reading of law school. I mean, literary theory and criticism is, uh, is a slog. It's tough reading and it requires sitting there with a dictionary and going line by line and reading very slowly and meticulously. And that's what you have to do when you read cases. Cases are not easy to read. You have to look for standard of review. You have to look for where the case is set, which uh, court you're in, uh, what the issues are, what the rule is, what the analysis is, what the conclusion is. And that requires intensive reading. And so both fields require an immersion in text. They require close reading. They require skill with interpretation. And so both fields are essentially doing literary theory and criticism, although one does it with imaginative literature as the subject and the other does it with legal cases as the subject. But at, at, at any rate, you are still um, interpreting texts, you are participating in hermeneutics, you are analyzing the meanings of words and uh, looking at syntax and structure. And so, you are dealing with language in, in both fields. So in that sense, they actually are not just separate fields, but they're really the same fields. You're doing the same sorts of activities, but with different subject texts. I, I love that. And I, I hope that some of our younger viewers and listeners take away from that, that being, you know, taking, taking their literary studies seriously, or you mentioned hermeneutics, you know, I, I think people who have a background in, in Bible study, which I think for a lot of, you know, for a lot of people outside of academia is kind of the last vestige of taking texts seriously, um, are such better lawyers, such better law students. And uh, yeah, I, I think I, I, I had exactly the same experience that you just described when I went to law school. I felt like 
you know, studying, uh, studying literature, studying the Bible, uh, studying poetry, you know, all of those things contributed to understanding the, the law better. Uh, I'm, I, I keep going off of our questions, but I, this to me is just really interesting. So I'm, I'm going to call it, call it audible here and on question three, do you think, so in, in literature today, we see a lot of people going to these works and, and doing one of two things, either saying, we don't like this, so we're going to throw it out. We're going to reject it. We're not going to study it. Or saying, we have to reinterpret this through some modern or postmodern lens. And so we can't just read literature. We have to have a lesbian reading of Shakespeare or a feminist reading of, you know, whatever, uh, and then I think you see the same thing in the law where people say, well, you know, we've got these laws, but a lot of them are old. And so we should either throw them out because the people who wrote them were bad or just different or people who say, well, for it to be a living constitution, we have to reimagine it through some, you know, some strange new lens. What, what connection do you see between, between all of those things, Alan? Gosh, I had about a hundred ideas just raced through my mind as you were talking, so I almost <laughs> don't know where to start. But there was a trend in literary studies toward professionalizing the discipline. There was a sense that what people were doing in English departments was too enjoyable. They were taking pleasure and <laughs> reading for fun and reading novels and plays and poetry for uh, art's sake. And... Uh, literary theory and criticism took a distinctively political turn where people were trying to make it relevant to the real world. And that meant that literature became secondary to the practicality of uh, literary criticism. And that literary criticism was politicized, highly politicized. And so you would get a lot of things like you'd get Marxist readings of Shakespeare. Shakespeare has been appropriated by everybody for every purpose because that's one of the beautiful things about Shakespeare is because Shakespeare does speak to basically every feature of the human condition. He can yeah. be appropriated and read in different ways. I think, that, I think the people who do that think they're mastering Shakespeare and they don't understand that Shakespeare is mastering them. But Well, but that's right. Ahead. They're basically using Shakespeare to make whatever political arguments they want to make for you know, that activist purpose. And uh, it's great that Shakespeare has that versatility that you can do that, but it also makes your readings of Shakespeare pretty weak. Um, as for the law, you know, I have a lot of thoughts on this. It, it used to be in order to validate your legal position, and I'm speaking historically like across the centuries, you had to look back to a textual network. I mean, if you'd look at our founders, and how they were justifying um, their cause, they were looking back to, you know, um, the Petition of Rights, the English Bill of Rights, Magna Carta, you know, the Charter of the Forest, all, all sorts of historical antecedents in order to say what we are doing now is not a radical project. In fact, I like the Kirkian view of the American founding that it was not a revolution, but a restoration because it was backward looking. And a lot of the patriots saw themselves as trying to preserve the rights and liberties that were ancient, that they enjoyed historically as Englishmen. And so they were trying to restore the government in the colonies to something that was enjoyed for centuries. Of course, you look at, uh, at you know, Magna Carta, you look at the ideas of natural law and common law that emerged out of the British experience. And in the 16th and 17th century, under thinkers like um, Cook and John Selden, jurists like that, um, and the, the complications with the parliament and the early Stuart monarchy, and you see a, a sort of a, a renewed emphasis on some of these traditions that maybe weren't uh, nameable at an earlier period. I mean, in, in let's say, um, the 1400s, English jurists weren't talking about the ancient constitution and rights that were enjoyed from time immemorial or time out of mind. But as the centuries went on and these ideas were recycled and repurposed, 
jurists were able to identify them and then place a name on something that was a historical phenomenon. But at any rate, law involved a backwards looking, and I don't mean backwards, but maybe rearwards looking. You had to, you had to anchor your uh, legal positions in precedent, in tradition, in order to validate them to the present. In our current area, we really suffer from presentism where we feel as though the past is just a giant package of inequities and injustices and wrongs that all need to be righted and that people are on the wrong or the right side of history. And it's all about moving forward. It's all about advancement. It's all about progress. But what I like to ask some of my friends on the left is, what would society have to look like before you would become a conservative? What would society have to look like for you to say, ah, there it is. We've got it right. And now we need to look to preserving the way we have it. Because if your motivating principle is change in itself, then you never attain anything. You just constantly move toward an unknown end. And that means that invariably your project is going to be undone along the way. So what is it? What is your teleology? Do you have one? Do you have some end goal that you're working toward? Or is your project based principally on this concept of change, which means that it's really based on nothing final? Yeah, yeah, I, I had, I think I, that first came home to me when I was talking with a, a, you know, liberal leftist in Seattle after a, uh, an interview or debate or something like that. And we were talking about some change in election law that the left was demanding. And I asked him why, I, I gave him my reasons and I asked him why, uh, you know, I asked him for his reasons and his reason basically boiled down to this is the next step. It's the next logical step, which I thought was a, was a fascinating sort of, for, in my mind, non-argument, right? We, 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 we should do this because, uh, because, you know, it, it's just sort of in the sweep of history, but, but no, no argument about why it's, why it's better, you know, why it's right. Um, but I yeah, want to get to the next thing. Marxism, has, Marxism sort of has a secular eschatology where there are different stages of history and different things are supposed to happen at each stage. And ultimately you end up with the proletariat overthrow of the capitalists and there's the final stage of history. At least there is a narrative, a, a meta narrative yeah. that people are seeking to conform their actions to. But although there is residual Marxism in the leftism we have today, there is no real sense of coherence. I mean, even with the, the the ideals that you see held up on the left today, they're fundamentally at odds with each other. On the one hand, you have equality. On the other hand, you have diversity. These ideals are utterly incompatible because diversity of human experience, diversity among people is predicated on the idea that we are all unique persons and that we all come to the world with different talents, different backgrounds, different experiences, different races, different ethnicities, different nationalities, and that all of these varieties contribute to enrich the human experience. Well, equality is a very different thing. That would The only way you can attain equality is if you had uniformity among people and you didn't have this diversity and people didn't bring distinct talents and and skills to the table. And equality would require leveling. It would require bringing down people that have natural talents so that the people that don't have that natural talents could stay. I mean, diversity and equality are conceptually incompatible. And yet on the left, they are elevated to these motivating ideas. And I don't know how that works out. I don't know how many people on the left really think through what are we doing in, in, in a big picture sense? What are we doing? Or are they just trying to win political battles here, win political battles, uh, battles there and amass power? And that seems to be a big problem for the left is the, the lack of coherence. I mean, yeah. for the right, with the right still fundamentally characterized by uh, religious people, um, even those who are not religious still operate within sort of a religious paradigm or framework, or at least aren't hostile to religion. You know, thinkers like Roger Scruton, who were secular, still appreciated the order that 
uh, religious traditions provided to society. And so there's always a sense of we're working towards something that is above and beyond us. There's something transcendental. We are just, you know, temporary players on a bigger project that is much larger than our own lifespans. And, um, you know, evangelical Christians, they look back thousands of years for their everyday guidance. They wake up and they do Bible studies and they're reading stuff from thousands of years ago and orienting their entire lives around history and philosophy and theology. And to me, those exercises give them a broader view and they're able to take a long view of politics. And at the end of the day, I think that means the right has a, uh, an intellectual advantage over the left. I think it, it at least makes humility possible. It doesn't guarantee humility, but it, it makes it a possibility. Whereas it seems like on the left, it's, I think that's a little more, more questionable. I, I want to I ask the next question, talking here with Professor Alan Mendenhall of Troy University on our Six Questions podcast. I, I, you're the first one, Alan, who's used the word Kirkian on the program. And so I, I'm going to call another audible here because... I, I'm certain that not all of our viewers and listeners know what you're referring to. Uh, Russell Kirk is he's somewhere behind me on the on the bookshelf, I think there, and, and I think over <laughs> over there. Too. <laughs> so, so tell people who's Russell Kirk. Why um, why would a you know mid 20th century American uh, writer be worth looking to reading, thinking about in 21st century America? Well, Russell Kirk, I would say, is the father of modern, modern American conservatism. And it's, I hesitate to say that because conservatism in itself is something that looks back a long way. And, um, you know, The Conservative Mind was Russell Kirk's sort of first big uh, book. It was a bestseller. And it detailed, uh, profiled several figures of conservatism um, by Kirk's interpretation. And it started with Burke and ended with Santayana in the first version, but in the second version, it ended with T.S. Eliot. And uh, Kirk had different canons of conservatism. I wish I could just restate them all here. They're, um, they, they're different iterations of it. Sometimes they're six, sometimes they're 10, but uh, a, a religious view um, of uh, human nature is, is one, um, uh, prudence, um, decentralized government, many different, um, many different canons. And I think Kirk's important because uh, precisely of the word you used um, moments ago, humility. There was a big to-do about Hayek and Kirk and Hayek writing an essay, why I'm not a conservative and Kirk taking issue with this essay. But when you read Kirk and you read Hayek side by side, you realize that they have in common a couple things and maybe their differences aren't so insurmountable. One is humility. They both have this emphasis on humility, on the fallibility of the human mind, the limitations of the human faculties. And frankly, the, uh, and, and to phrase it in religious terms, which uh, Hayek wouldn't have used, but maybe the sinful state of, of the human condition. Um, and the second would be, uh, a, a, an emphasis on what Kirk would call tradition, and Hayek didn't like that word, but Hayek would use the term custom. And the way Hayek uses the term custom sounds a lot like the way Kirk uses the term tradition, so they may not have been that far apart. But uh, I think that um, Kirk is very important because uh, right now, I do think I just praised the the the, the right as having a, a sort of an, an intellectual um, upper hand against the left, but that's not what you see on TV. That's not what you see um, too often among the Republican Party candidates. We're in a very telegenic area, a commercialized uh, political area where people are sort of appealing to the lowest common denominator. We're trying to um, convert the masses and everybody's trying to appeal to the masses and get as many voters as possible, which means people are making intellectual sacrifices, people are making intellectual compromises, and just trying for mass appeal. Well, Kirk really shows you that the conservative tradition is a very high-minded intellectual tradition. It enjoys a distinguished career in the West, 
And it is not all about just jockeying for votes or owning the libs, so to speak. <laughs> it, it has a very long and storied history and we are sort of imperfectly carrying it out in our present moment, but uh, it will continue and it will be a longstanding uh, tradition that will go on long after we're uh, gone from this world. Alan, I'm, I'm going to stay on this horse because uh, because <laughs> this, I mean, this this conversation for me is so much fun. This is we're talking about all kinds of things that that I I think are are both interesting and important. And so I want to ask you a question about Hayek and Kirk and the Declaration of Independence that I think is very mm -hmm. relevant to Americans today who are trying to figure out what cons what does it mean to be a conservative? Uh, is it okay to be a conservative? I, I know that I think this has changed a little bit, but it seemed like 10 years ago, if you met a young person on the political right, they would very quickly say, oh, I'm not a conservative. I'm a classical liberal. I'm a libertarian. I'm something I'm a Republican, but I'm not a conservative. They were they were sort of buying into that Hayek argument, whether they knew it or not. I think the difference. And I, so I want you to respond to this. I think the difference is the Declaration of Independence and, and perhaps the Constitution as well. To be a conservative in Europe, it seems to me to have always had overtones of, of class and of just sort of looking to the past as, as you know, as uh, um, sort of the, the best thing that we have, whatever is there, it should, you know, the default should be toward preserving past institutions, which I, I think that American conservatives would would largely but not entirely agree with. But as American conservatives, we look to the Declaration and the Constitution to fix things, which is why we can, you know, American conservatives can be such radicals because we can want to overturn a lot about the present order in order to get back to the principles of the Declaration and the government of the Constitution. I mean, is do you think that that captures a little bit of that conflict between Hayek and Kirk and why they could be, you know, sort of saying opposite things on the surface, but you know, Hayek is really responding to a European kind of conservative conservative view, whereas Kirk is an American. Yeah, I mean, this is a very complicated topic. I mean, Kirk was responding to Lionel Trilling, who sort of suggested that America had no conservative tradition. <laughs> that America was fundamentally liberal and had been liberal in the classical sense, and. Um, you know, Kirk is showing that, um, and if you look at Roots in American Order, it's a different, a different book that shows the different influences, the cities of, you know, Athens, Rome, Jerusalem, London, and Philadelphia, each standing in the place for some sort of tradition. And each of those traditions is different, right? The, um, the, the sort of the, um, the, the Jewish, the scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures have a slightly different emphasis from the, the, the New Testament scriptures, um, the, the Lockean liberalism that influenced people like Jefferson is much different from the Athenian rationalism that uh, also influenced the founders. And the Roman classicalism is a very different from, from that model. So we are, you know, inheritors of many, many different themes throughout history. And I think that's part of what makes it so complicated to use these categories of conservative and liberal. And you're right that class was always a fundamental feature of European conservatism. And there was a sense of aristocracy and, and, uh, uh, and a sense that uh, since I'm we tied into monarchy, and 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 so we didn't have that in in the United States, um, and you know someone like Jefferson, who was very alive to the reality that he was writing against a lot of that European tradition. I mean, I love Jefferson. Jefferson is a Southerner. He's a lawyer. Um, he studied law under George Wythe. He was the author of the Declaration of Independence, the principal author of it, at least. Um, he drafted uh, Virginia legislation. He's a state legislator for uh, religious freedom. He was president. He was vice president under Adams. He was our first secretary of state. He was this agri uh, agrarian cosmopolitan who 
you know, was an Enlightenment thinker in the Newtonian and Baconian and uh, Lockean tradition. He liked wine. He liked horticulture. He spoke many languages. He studied classical literature and politics. He founded UVA. He was a champion of natural law. He was a bibliomaniac. I, I just, I love Jefferson. If, if I had to choose a favorite founder, that's who it would be. <laughs> and I think it's because he's such a, he's such a symbol of knowledge and learning. And he does wed some of these different traditions, sort of the conservative and uh, the liberal. He is a classical liberal. And uh, I think, you know, to the extent that you could find one figure that marries these different traditions, I think Jefferson might be might be it. Well, I, I'm talking with Alan Mendenhall, professor at Troy University uh, and the author of Shouting Softly, Lines on Law, Literature and Culture. And Alan, our sixth question is always the same and you just anticipated it perfectly. So I'm going <laughs> to give you an opportunity to, uh, you know, if you want to say anything more about Jefferson. The sixth question is always, who is your favorite founding father and why? I think you just delivered uh, a, a wonderful description of the importance of, of Jefferson. I, I don't know. Do you want to tie a bow on that for our, our sixth, uh, sixth answer here? Oh gosh. Well, I wish, I wish I had known what <laughs> question we were on. I, I was frankly wondering, I, I thought, I don't even know what question we're on, but <laughs> um, well, I, I'll, I'll just say that Jefferson has had a bad rap um, in recent years. Um, and uh, I think, that very serious scholars who want to sit down and study um, Jefferson will find much to appreciate. If you look at some of his legal cases and some of his appeals to natural law when he was uh, looking to free some slaves, I think that was a, that's, those are fascinating places to start because um, he makes arguments that abolitionists would use years later. I mean, Jefferson's a complex figure, and, and we always try to look to history for good guys and bad guys and place people in simplistic categories, but sometimes it's more um, rewarding to wrestle with somebody who has these tensions, and I think that doing that with Jefferson helps us to stay humble and helps us to understand that, look, all of us are going to be held to some impossible standard by some future generation. And we are all gonna look bad for some reason that we don't even know about yet because we can't anticipate it. So we ought to be humble and um, you know, somewhat generous in our interpretation of past figures and events and not hold them up to standards that were impossible to meet in their own era, because we will inevitably fail to meet some standard in the future. And we are all just human beings trying to do our best in a really complicated world. And, you know, if we're going to have political differences and we're going to have disagreements. The most important thing is that we have them civilly. We keep them at the level of rhetoric and discourse so that they don't degenerate into violence and that we learn to live peacefully together and to reason together as civil beings and, uh, and hopefully happy beings. That's a wonderful way to conclude the program. Professor Mendenhall, thank you so much for being on Six Questions. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks to all of you for watching and, and listening. Thanks for being a part of the Save Our States effort on social media to spread the word about the importance of American institutions, including obviously in, in particular, the Electoral College. Thanks to our producer, Harry Roth and the rest of the Save Our States team. We'll see you next time.